Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Ben, and in this episode of the Smoking Hot Confessions Barbecue Podcast, I'm talking to Stephen West, aka Westy, multiple trophy winning pitmaster from Moist Barbecue and founder of Slow Burner Barbecue Rubs. This is the internationally awarded Smoking Hot Confessions Barbecue Podcast with your host, Ben Arnott. How long's it been since your last confession? Westy, mate, long time no see. It's been all of about, what, six days? How are you? That's it. Awesome. Yeah, um, good to see you. Thanks for having me on. But, um, mate, it's, yeah. it's, it's fantastic to have you here. Thank you. So tell me, mate, what was the last thing that you barbecued? Um, probably at the comp in Toowoomba, actually. Um, all those steaks and all the ancillaries we just did. So they haven't had a chance to sort of settle down after that. So that's, that's pretty much where we're at. So you're telling um, me that you haven't cooked any barbecue during the week since? No. After doing the, the quad steak and the um all the ancillaries and then um yeah, helping out with the um with an ABA team as well. It's um yeah, it was um good to have a little break and um yeah, enjoy not barbecue, unfortunately. <laughs> yeah. Now you ha- you have been doing some miles. You're based in Melbourne, but I just saw you up in Toowoomba with your yep. with your competition barbecue team moist barbecue so let's let's kick things off with with moist barbecue i can see that you got your shirt on there for them tell us about yep. about um actually you know what let's go right back to the start how did you get into barbecue okay so um it was in 2016 i got a um an invite from my brother to come to an event in the city and he basically like, he didn't give much information it was literally just a a barbecue event, barbecue and beers, and they got hot sauces there, and they would just go and have a look, and it was at the Queen Vic um, market. And it turned out to be the um, the KCBS-sanctioned um, Yaks event. So um, I went along, and without knowing what I was actually looking at, or just all these you know big trailer pits, um, just all these teams set up, just, just did, didn't know what I was actually sort of looking at. And then it sort of clicked the more I was looking around. I saw the awards stage and all this other stuff. I thought, this is competition barbecue. It's actually here. It's a thing. So um, I went away from there, still not knowing how to sort of actually apply it into anything. And then um, we, the Pitmaster show come on the telly. So um, I was watching, you know, Myron and Tuffy and all the – all that um, on the Pitmaster show and it all just sort of made sense. And then I started YouTubing things and just really sort of, um, yeah, just, just trying to sort of look at the, um, the competition style of barbecue, I suppose. And um, yeah, that's, that's sort of, that, that, that was the, the, the start of it, I suppose. And um, so I grabbed the, um, grabbed the Weber off the old man, got, got his kettle and um, he had it for years. He barely ever used it. So I um, brought it home threw a couple of chickens in there and um, yeah, just sort of mucking around, just doing a couple of things and then saw all these offsets and I had like compressor tanks lying around and like, well, I better make an offset, I suppose. Like, yeah, that's what you do when you're trying to, you know, really get into it and um, get involved in it. And I kept on saying to the dude um, that I was working with, I'm like, I kept on pulling up the 2017 Yaks, um, the KCBS comp, and I kept on pulling up and showing him, and he just said, well, why don't you enter? And it's like, oh, no, I wouldn't be able to do that. I can't do that. And he just, he almost forced me, and he said, if you don't stop talking, I'm not going to listen to you anymore unless you just enter and just make it a thing. So, um, yeah, so we basically entered and just um, panicked, I suppose, like once it was actually sort of, you know, once we're actually entered and into it. Um, then we had to start working out how to cook, like, pulled pork and brisket and, yeah, you know, the the chicken and pork ribs, and then it was just sort of yeah, just just started from there. So you so, entered the competition first, and then started working out your recipes and your and your techniques. In a roundabout way, yeah. <laughs> yep. <laughs> nice. Yeah. And tell um, me, how did that um how did that DIY offset turn out? Yeah, it was good. I have to send some photos through um later on. It was um. It was actually a bit of a strange setup. I had the big um, cook chamber, two doors on it, and um, I actually set another compressor tank sort of sideways because I wanted to be able to grill on the top of the firebox as well and then sort of shoot the fire up into it. And I'm, I don't even know how I cooked on it. We're looking at it now. It's, um, it was just that bodgy design. And um, it just seemed to work. It just it, it did it did well for us to start with. And then, um, yeah, just... It was yeah, it was a bit of fun. It, it was just a good sort of in um, into the scene, I suppose. So yeah, that's interesting that your um, 
that that your background is a little bit uh, different to other people in that you went straight into competition barbecue. Like most people sort of find barbecue first, then they find competition barbecue. You sort of went straight into it. Yeah, I've, I've kind of went the wrong way. Um, I've, I've always sort of liked barbecue. I liked having um, like spits over the grills and all that. Yeah, you know, um, spit cooking love for our wedding. Um, the only thing I really wanted, and um, it was just I wanted a spit. And I wanted you know just something on there. Wanted that fire going, all that kind of business. That was my only request. So I've always just sort of had that um, sort of love for the charcoal cooking and all that kind of stuff. But then I suppose it didn't really. No, it didn't really all click together until I, I saw that first comp. And then when I was walking through, and it's like, ah, this is what we are. This is this is barbecue. So yeah. yeah, nice, nice. Now, whatever happened to those yaks competitions? They were on, they were big, and then they were gone. Not sure. We don't we don't get many KCBS comps here, and um, that was one of the bigger ones because I think it was on. There, there was, yeah, there, there was a 2018 one as well, and then I think once that had just sort of stopped, it just sort of. Um, just windled out, I suppose. So yeah, not not actually sure why. Yeah, I I think since then in 2018, I think we've had um two KCBS comps up here in Queensland, and yep. that's it. Well, there's a couple in Perth, but yeah, there, there's um not much else here. Like um, there's been a couple in Melbourne. Like Luke runs a couple. Um, but yeah, in terms of KCBS, so there's, there's, but it's a yeah, it'd be good to get back to some of that kind of cooking. Like I, I love ABA, but it's also the, the half hour windows of KCBS, it really sharpens you. It makes you sort of really, you know, as soon as you start falling behind on one, you really got to catch it up. You got to be on your game in KCBS. So, yeah. Yeah, it is a, it is a certainly a bit of a higher pressure sort of situation, isn't it? And you, you're right. I did misspeak before. I, I, I meant to say the East coast. We haven't seen one on the East coast oh, right, uh, yeah. since yeah. Uh, like f- for a long time. I'm, I'm aware the jewels are still doing a lot with uh, KCBS over in WA. Oh yeah. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Now, so Moist Barbecue, the actual competition team, how did the team come yeah. together? Is it is it family? Is it mates? How does it work? It was mates. Um, it started out as um, – so we used to go around and watch Sons of Anarchy on, on the telly um, with four of us. And it was um, – mate I went to high school with his neighbour and his brother-in-law. And it was every Thursday we'd just have a catch-up, just have some beers, all that kind of stuff. And then when I started getting into the, the Pitmaster show, that's when I started bringing that into it. So we watched our episodes of the Sons of Anarchy and then I'd sort of go, well, what about this one? What about, you know, all that kind of stuff. So that's where it kept sort of um, starting from there. So they were the original members. And um, then, so the name, the, the, the name isn't the most, um, I suppose, approachable name. <laughs> and um, it's because we... Um, we started and we just thought, well, we need a, we need, we need to call ourselves something. So, um, as soon as I, you know, we sort of said, oh, what about the moist boys or what about, um, my, and, um, yeah, um, what was it? Morgan come running out from the back room and she goes, you better not call yourself moist. That's disgusting. And we're like, all right, that's it. That's our name. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. We just had to do it. And, um, yeah, it just sucked from there. So yeah, that was, um, just a bit of fun. And yeah, so that was the team leading into the the first comp, and we just uh, really didn't know what we were getting in, getting ourselves into. And um, yeah, we had way too much equipment. The first comp, we had a, a full cabinet down the back. I had every single spice and um, product you can think of, just to to sort of you know make our own rubs there and all the, all the rest of the stuff. But um, we're not getting fifth overall at the first comp, and um, like first in chicken. So that um, wow. was out of fifty wow. teams, yeah. So that was that was nuts. We weren't expecting that because when they when they read the name out for chicken, I was just sitting there clapping, and then the mates were like, "Come on, we're gonna go up and get our trophy." Like, what? It wasn't us. So yeah, it was just, it was just a shock. Um, so to get fifth overall as well, it was yeah, that was um, it was nuts. Definitely weren't expecting it. So yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that's that's a great <laughs> achievement, man. So good, so good. Yeah. But then we uh, rolled into meat stock and got forty second overall, so it's a good leveler. Well, I was just <laughs> I, I was just about to ask, like you're you're winning trophies pretty much back to back now. What was the road like to this point? Like, did you struggle for a while before you sort of started to see some improvements? How did you and and how did you refine your processes? Like, how did you get from struggling to winning trophies? Um, probably YouTube. And just videos and just information and books, cookbooks. I've got a heap of cookbooks just to sort of um, just 
try stuff and practice. It all comes down to practice. Unfortunately, you can't just roll into a comp and just expect to do well. You need to do practice. So the um, 2018 um, me stock, we got dead ass last in stake. And because they, they called our number out, and my brother's sitting there going, yeah, they called your number. And I'm like, I don't want to give up. I don't, I don't want to accept this award of dead ass last. <laughs> so, um, so I walked up, did the did the walk of shame, got the got the um the little sticker they give you and all that kind of stuff, and um then from there it was yeah you know, I think they call it out just to make it embarrassing for you so you don't do that again, and um so we went from there and just basically practiced, got some grill grades, um tried to just work out what flavors we liked, what flavors you know we've sort of heard rumors there, what people are using and all that kind of stuff, and um just put that towards just practicing basically. So we had a, um, we went to Horsham for the next comp and we got first place. So got a golden ticket and um, yeah, got a golden ticket after just literally just practicing and getting last and just trying to work out what to do and not do that again. Um, so but it, it was a bit of a, bit of a funny, well, we had a, a Cypress grill just with fire. We sort of lifted that up um, cause you can, you can adjust the height. So we had the, um, the grill grade on, that and then we had a lid off a pro cue, but you know, on a uh, off a um, <laughs> bullet smoker, sort of on that again. So, um, Ken from the SCA came over and he goes, Oh, you know, well, well done on your, on your golden ticket. And he, he looked at our eraser and he's like, Oh, wow, <laughs> how did you do that? So, <laughs> but it worked for us, so yeah, it all, it all just sort of come together for us and worked well. So, yeah, that was, but yeah, um, it's unfortunately, it's all just practice, um. And that's all. Okay. And even now, like even um, we were sort of doing well in 2018 and then it's like, we've just been sort of just gradually just sort of coming down from there a bit. So it's trying to work out, you know, what, what people are doing, where the scene is. And I think that the scene gets better every time. So I was trying to keep up with the scene, but also trying to get that next step ahead again. And um, it's, it's weird. It's sort of, it's just sort of, it's grilled food in the box, but there's so many elements and everything that goes along with it. And then the, um, when the competition gets better around you, it's hard to score against people that are doing so well. And, you know, it's hard to just sort of, yeah, just, um, yeah, I'm not sure where I went with that one. <laughs> Sorry. That's all right. That's all right. That That's a great point. I've, yeah. um, you, you mentioned keeping up with the scene. Now, do you mean mm. keeping up with what other competitors are doing or do you mean keeping up with, um, what trends are happening in the food world that the judges might be into? So for example, if, I don't know, pomegranate juice suddenly becomes wildly popular. Are you keeping like your eyes on magazines to see if what pom- what pomegranate juice can be used on, on your steak or something for a ridiculous example? In a way, like, um, so there's a couple of things from the steak at, at Toowoomba that we applied to and it, it paid off. Um, the, I suppose if good food is always going to be good food and in 2018, the steaks we were doing was literally um, the Meat Church Holy Cow Rub and a little bit of butter and they, they, and just on grill grades, trying to make it look pretty. And then from there, then we started, like, then you start looking at what other people are handing in. They, you know, when you get to see their, their photos, get to taste their food, and when they're doing well, you're like, okay, now we need to do marinades and we need to tie out steaks so they look a bit pretty for appearance. And then the next year, then then another trend sort of comes out. And then the more trend is in the sense of when you see what people are doing and how they're applying it to their cooks, then you're like, well, now I need to practice that. And I need to um, get my texture so- scores better or appearance better and all that kind of stuff. Like the, even um, our ABA boxes have, have changed widely from even the start of the year. Like we sort of, we had not much, but, you know, just sort of put piles of food in the box. Whereas now, we're almost using things just to really make it just, just, just sharp and dialed in. And, and as much as it, um, it's, I don't know, it, you, you eat with your eyes. So the more you, the more attention you put into that appearance, then yeah, the, um, the better off the, the, the scores are going to be, I suppose, because as soon, if they open a messy box, even if there's a couple of things sort of out of place, then they sort of question, well, why is that out of place? And what happened with the cook? Like, what, um, is there something that's gone wrong with this box that they're almost trying to hide in, in a way as well? So if it doesn't look perfect, then what's wrong? Why did they throw it in? Um, 
so yeah, there's, there's a bit of that. There's, and, and I suppose, so, yeah, what I mean by keeping up with the scene was um, we thought we were still cooking good steaks and they weren't scoring well. So that's when you got to go back to the drawing board to go, well, how do we make it score as good as what everyone else is scoring? So that, that's what I mean by sort of keeping up with the scene a bit, I suppose. So, yeah. yeah, yeah. Nice. Well, whatever you're doing, mate, it's obviously working because you absolutely crushed it. At Meatstock Melbourne. Tell us about Meatstock Melbourne. That was, um, everything just came together. We had, um, so we got RGC, so Re- Reserve Grand Champion, second overall. And um, it was an, an incredible kind of um, achievement, I suppose. But it was, um, it was one of those cooks that everything just came together. It's all the things that we've been trying to practice and um, just do and um, apply to our cooks. It all just sort of, just happened. So we, um, one of the biggest things was um, one of our teammates, Ash, um, he just got a trailer pit and everything just seemed to just work with that. And as a team, we sort of, we got, Ash looks after the big cook. He looks after the, the, the trailer pit fire. He looks after the briskets and the um, the pork and the, the larger cuts. Um, we got, I do the sort of pretty stuff and we all do trimming. We all sort of make the sauces together and then, Russell basically just keeps us in check and keeps me happy. So um, that is the good luck. Um, so, um, yeah, so it's like we all just sort of figured out our roles at the right time. And um, especially for me, stock, it was one of those cooks where we just sort of, um, we had it, we sort of shrugged our shoulders and went, well, I suppose it was all right. Like it felt all right. Everything in the box felt good. It all ate well. And, um, yeah, everyone kept asking, you know, after we handed in. And they're like, oh, how'd you, how'd you cook on? I was like, well, we went. And um, one of the one of the funny things was we did the, the chicken box. We did the, you know, handed it in. We walked back and um, there was a rubbery bit of skin on the um, on the board. So we come back and we tested that. And we're like, oh, God, our chicken box is gone now. So, um, but it must have been the only bit of rubbery skin because that ended up getting first at, at, um, at me stock. So, um, yeah, when we got the call out for first, we're like, <laughs> yeah, definitely wasn't expecting that. So, yeah, um, it all, but yeah, it, it, it literally all just come together. Everyone just found their found their place. We got our rhythm. Um, we also had another people, um, that the couple that were in with us. So, um, they won tickets to cook with Boar's Night Out. Um, at the first meat stock, that would end up being cancelled. And um, so because they still had that ticket, they still wanted to just jump in with the team and just sort of, you know, just just learn and you know, just have a look. look at, have a bit of a look at how we did kind of thing. So uh, I think it was just good energy having someone to just sort of um, in there sort of almost watching us and, you know, just sort of just appreciating that as well. And um, yeah, they, they said afterwards, they just said, yeah, you just work very well as a team. It was just that, just that kind of um, all just flowed. So yeah. Awesome. Um, awesome. Yeah. So if I understood that right, you took a new trailer. Sorry, the question. To me. <laughs> yeah. You you took a new uh, trailer pit to uh, to meet Stock Melbourne, and uh, and crushed it on a brand new pit. Yeah. Uh, not brand new. Um, so Ash has cooked in it for a bit. He's um he's done a few you know catering gigs out of it. Um, done a bit of cooking, but it was the it was the key that brought everything together. Because we've had we've been cooking on drums, offsets, all just so many other units. Whereas just having that dedicated unit that was just running. And that was it. Um, that just did the big cooks, and then we just had a Weber and a Pro Q for the for the other part of it. Um, that was literally. It was just we were able to just dial it in and just sort of not have so many fires all over the place. It was just one sort of just solid unit that just sat on probably um, two ninety just all day. Um, it just loves it. You just throw another stick in every forty five minutes, and you don't have to touch it. Um, it just does its job. It just rocks along. It's beautiful. Nice. Is that another home built so, job? No, no, there was um it's a Bullock Head Creek smoker, I think. Okay. Um yeah, so it all mounted on a trailer. Um and yeah, it was one of those sort of buys where he's like, Well, it wasn't an impulse, it was definitely a, a, a thought about buy. But um for the price it's like well it's hard to justify. So that's why a lot of the catering sort of happened from that. And um yeah, just try to get back some of that sort of impulse money, I suppose. <laughs> and, um, yeah, just, uh, if, um, and then, yeah, to be able to use a unit like that 
in comps. Um, like we've used offset offsets before and all the rest of it, but to have it in in with the comp with us, it was um yeah, it was it definitely helped just help bring everything together. Yeah, very nice. Now, obviously, you couldn't take that up to Toowoomba, but uh, when I saw you there, you were actually hanging out with uh, with Dusty Q. Tell us about yeah, that partnership. Yeah, um, we we've, we've sort of been friends for a little bit, and um, we I don't know. I think it was after me stock Melbourne. We just sort of just just meshed really well um, together, and they, and they said, well, you know, do you want to come up and cook with us? And like we're gonna, have, you know, they'll have their full set up at at, um, at Toowoomba. So um, we did the two days SCA, the the Thursday Friday, wasn't it? And um, so yeah, we did. We had our SCA hand ins, and they did like SCA as well. So it was it was a busy tent. So um, we came back on the on the Saturday just to literally just to sort of hang out and um, you know, cook with them and have some fun. We we ran all the boxes for them. We were just sort of you know testing sauces and flavors and all the rest of it. And um, yeah, we just felt like we had a good cook together. And then um, yeah, then they ended up winning the whole thing. So um. Yeah, they got um, grand champion up at Toowoomba, and I think I'm pretty sure we're just calling ourselves the um, the good luck charms now. That's great, man. That's great. <laughs> so, did all did all four of you have a crack at the quadruple SCA? Yeah. Oh no, no, sorry, um, Russell. So yeah, it was, it was three of us out of um, Russell was helping me. He's the um, the the dude on the end there. So um, yeah, he was helping me with my hand ins and um, yeah, we were still sort of all helping each other with things. So yeah, so three out of one ten, especially for the quad and the the four ancillaries and the, the, yeah, there was a lot of cooking out of that site. Yeah, well, that's what twenty four steaks or something, isn't it? Mm. Two um, two two steaks per person, three people for eight for four competitions. I think that's twenty four oh, steaks. You're making me do maths. <laughs> um, that's a lot of. Well, there was a lot of. It took a lot to pick all the steaks because um, even just rolling through on the table, just you know, doing all the reverse order and the the two steaks each day. It was over an hour. It was over an hour. It was a bloody long time just selecting all those steaks. So interesting. Yeah, that's a lot of cooking. <laughs> did you did you select all? Like all the stakes at once, or did they do a selection each for each new round? No, that was uh, so we did the the two on the Thursday and then two on the Friday. Um, so basically, yeah, so two categories, I suppose. So we yeah we had to pick four stakes um, each day. Ah, so interesting. Yeah, that's a and, that's a lot of stakes. <laughs> and what did you think of it as a as a concept, a, a quadruple SCA? I liked it. Um, one of the big things being in the field was um, it was the awards weren't until on the Friday night. So the the Thursday stakes that we handed in, um, there was no critique or we didn't know how we actually went. So there was no adjustment of method. Um, so we rolled into Friday with the exact same method. Um, I just we, we just tried sticking with that and just hoped it worked. And um, I think that was. I, I'm not sure if we would have changed too much, even if we had got the um, base off the of the first day. If they did tell us the results then, um, but it, it kind of worked out for us. We got um, fifth and sixth in basically every category, uh, every every one of the stakes. So um, we got about 26 or 28 championship points out of that weekend. It was crazy. Um, it was a good earner for us, and it proved our method was good. Um, but it just made it hard to. Um, it was yeah. I suppose. You, you have your, your your practice stake, your burner stake, and um, I suppose it's just trusting the method and trusting that it's good. And we we just sort of we we were sort of testing that, people reading it, and we're just like, well, seems good. So we just yeah, just just keep rocking with that. So yeah, um, but no, I, I like the um the the theory of it. Like the the more competition, the better. I, I say. So. <laughs> Yeah, very nice. Look, that's probably a good point for us to, to just take a minute, have a little break, and then we'll be right back. In our busy modern lives, there are some things we need more of. More time, more money, more fun with friends and family, and of course, more delicious food. Here at Smoking Hot Confessions, we believe all this can be done through barbecue. 
Join us at Barbiecon, the online barbecue bonanza, cooking up two huge days of events, entertainment and opportunities with some of the biggest names in the Australian barbecue industry and an international special guest or two. Barbiecon is the online barbecue festival that brings Australia's best barbecue pitmasters and business owners live into the lounge rooms of barbecue lovers everywhere. Through demonstrations and presentations, these pros hold nothing back to ensure that you get more from your barbecue. Day one is all about cooking barbecue, where you'll learn tips, tricks, and treats from the best in the industry. Day two covers the business of barbecue, where our guests share their stories, advice, and strategies about going pro. So if you're up for some thrilling grilling, head on over to barbiecon.eventbrite.com.au to secure your tickets. We also have some great side dishes for our ticket buyers. Not only will you see the best barbecue pitmasters and business owners live in your lounge room, you'll also receive a 12-month membership to the Barbiecon Library where the Barbiecon presentations will be available after the event, a digital swag bag full of goodies from our partners and presenters, and VIP tickets only will receive an invite to an exclusive happy hour chat with our presenters on the Saturday and Sunday evenings. So check out the ticket options and we look forward to seeing you at Barbiecon. It's going to be smoking hot. Got a project you'd like to work on with the SHC team? Shoot Ben an email on ben at smokinghotconfessions.com and let's have a conversation. Alrighty, let's start talking slow burner barbecues, mate. That's um that's your your business arm. So tell us about uh, about when you decided to make the jump from being a a competitive barbecuer into being a barbecue entrepreneur. So. I've been making rubs the whole time, I suppose. Like from the start, as I said, when we um, when we rolled into our first comp, I had so many just spices and just raw ingredients just to start with. So I always liked making my own product to 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 go into that um, kind of thing. And because of the name Moist, I didn't want to really sort of release a try to release a business under the name of Moist. So um, slow burner just sort of happened from like I love hot rods. I love the the steampunk style, I love that kind of um, that kind of vibe. So that name just sort of just went into it a bit, and it is a slow burn. Like the the whole um, kind of business, the process, all of it's it, it's just been a real just sort of build and just a yeah, um, just keeps sort of yeah, it's a slow build, a slow burn. So um, and yeah, from so that first we got first in chicken at the at the um, KCBS comp. That's still pretty much the same rub that we've got right now. Um, oh, wow. I know it was literally just that rub and um, just a bit of sort of um, honey glaze over it as well. So um, that was another reason I kind of I stuck with that rub. And I suppose I like a bit more of a sort of savoury rub, um, a bit more sort of a bit, bit punchier kind of rub. So um, so having a... a um, what am I getting there? So I think there's a lot of sweet rubs out there. There wasn't really much that I think I was blending too much kind of stuff together to try to get what I was sort of after. So, um, so to be able to have um, something a bit more sort of savory, I can always add a, a sweeter sauce over it, like, like, like the honey glaze sauce, like a, yeah, like, like a, a sweet barbecue sauce. Um, so I like having that, that sort of deeper undertone of a, of a, of a flavor. So um, I suppose that's where the rubs that I created were basically from having that, trying to balance out the sweet barbecue sauce with a, yeah, just a, a real savory kind of undertone. So, um, and yeah, basically they literally started with the, um, so this Jonas Cramey book, um, he's got a page in here and it was just like, this was one of the early books I sort of started with. And it was just, um, just how to make a sing- signature rub. And he's got his little method here about sort of what to put into it and all that kind of thing. And it was um, just from there, I, I just kept on sort of um, using that and then sort of targeting ingredients to go with certain proteins. So um, the chicken one was first and the chicken one was always, I was almost trying to make it as a bit of an all-purpose, but um, I liked lemon pepper on chicken and I liked um, certain ingredients, but then I didn't want to have like a, a master foods lemon pepper in my rub. Um, I wanted to have it as a, as a, you know, try to start with the raw ingredients to start with. So then I went backwards to like white pepper and citric acid and um, that kind of thing. So trying to sort of 
target what I like about um, cooking with certain proteins and the flavors I like on them. So, um, so yeah, the chicken one is wildly different from the pork one, even though they, they look very similar. Then they, both of those were based off that kind of off that um, that little sort of method that was in that book. And um, but the pork one, I've gone more of a so went more of a, like a fennel, like cardamom kind of feel with pork because um, a lot of the times when I'm coming up with the the recipes for the rubs, I base it off just literally looking up recipes. So if I just type in like beef dishes or popular beef dishes or popular pork dishes or that kind of thing, and it's just, it's those certain ingredients that keep on com- coming up that you're like, well, that kind of has to be in that, that kind of rub. But, um but fennel is just classic combination with it. Um, the so beef, I've got the um, like mustard powder and like all those sort of real sort of savory, you know, earthy kind of things that just kept coming up in all the recipes. I kept sort of you know researching. Um, so it's pretty much how I sort of come up with um, the the targeted protein um, rubs, I suppose. So and. Um, yeah, from there, like uh, the um, the lamb lifter was sort of just real herby. Um, it's very different from all the rest of them. It's more of a sort of it's almost like an Italian herb. Um, and I think it was I was sort of mucking around at the time with the um, the tree bark as well. And um, I went and I was mixing other stuff with it with that, I suppose. So um, I didn't want to keep mixing things together. I wanted to have something consistent. So it was more just sort of having the um, yeah, having the lamb rub that's made with all the stuff that I like in it, just to start with, and then just sort of mm-hmm. apply that to the meat and not have to keep adding extra stuff into it. I mean. Yeah, yeah, nice. So, I'm, I'm, I'm just going to take you back a second there. Could you just show that sorry. book to us again? Ah, um, Texas Barbecue, Meat, Smoke, uh, and Jonas, Love. Yeah, um, Jonas Cranby. Um, it was in like... Um, and it's got, this was like one of the ones I literally started with. It was um, just, it had a lot of things in there that I just sort of gravitated towards. And um, so that's his Texas one. Another one that um, I'm probably skipping ahead a little bit, but I'll show you anyhow while we're on the book thing. Um, this is another one by him, and it's the, the oh, yeah, wrong way. <laughs> um, Tex Mex from Tex-Mex. scratch. <laughs> Um, and yeah, that book is just such a go-to. It's just um, there's so many good things in there from um, pickled ingredients from what like, just um, and they just I think he he suits the style that I like. It's a bit sort of a bit more sort of savory, a bit more flavor rather than sort of yeah, um, other type of cooking. So I just it, it sort of spoke to me a bit. I, I had a few books. I had the like hardcore. Um, book Tuffy's books, all the all the other stuff to start with, but then yeah, there's there's one there's some that just, they just sort of they just stand out. Um, there's some where you just sort of you just just keep going back to it and it just keeps sort of yeah you know, everything you eat out of it it just feels good it feels right. So and that one, yeah that one just um, it literally just had a method just to start with, but from that method he said, well, how about try adding this and how about um, those other things as well. So. Um, that's when I just started mucking with, you know, just, just trying to have that different kind of blends and different ratios on, didn't want to have too much of certain things in there, but it also wanted, you know, I wanted to balance enough that you do get that hit, but you also, um, it's not overwhelming. Mm, very nice. Very nice. So what, what's been some of the biggest challenges that you've faced when you're, uh, when you've been building this, uh, this business? Um, <laughs> Every step's a, a, a hustle, I suppose. Like, um, you got to so um, finding the the jars that it goes in, getting labels that look nice. Um, so I got a, a bloke around the corner that um, designed the labels, and I, I I just had the brief, and I said I just want them to to just jump off the shelf. I want them to just literally just you know just grab you and just go ah, buy me. And um, but I also wanted that product in there to um to match that as well. I wanted the, I wanted the, the label to match the product. Um, and I, I wanted them punchy. I wanted them sort of, you know, just really, um, vibrant. So, um, so yeah, getting that right look to start with to reflect the brand, to reflect the, reflect the brand. Um, and then getting jars and then getting, um, 
just all the stuff that goes along with it and then trying to work out all your, your shipping and then sort of making it. And then I was making it to start with. And then I've, you know, I've started making, um, I've started getting a, a, um, a, a packer to basically make it, but then they start with a minimum of 300 kilos. So it's a lot of rub to commit to and it's a lot, a lot of sort of outlay to, um, to start going down that route. And um, yeah, so there's, there's a few that are, I've already sort of bashed up and I've just got, look, my house is filling up. <laughs> um, yeah, I need more sort of storage than that. So um, so I suppose the next step is do I keep committing to um, packing it all myself, doing all, all that kind of stuff? Um, and then, or do I go, yeah, down the, the co-packer route and then give someone else to distribute and all that kind of business? So there's, there's a, yeah. It's just, I suppose, every step is just another, just another thing to just keep sort of working out, and then um, all the um, all the social media, all the the recipes, all the um, everything that goes along with it. So over the um, Chrissy break, I sort of I had a chance to just um, do a heap of cooking and heap of recipes, and all I basically got out of it was probably six recipes. Um, but it's the kind of thing I wanted to have. Um, coming out basically every Thursday, Arvo, I suppose, um, just so it's, you know, just, just release a recipe. Um, obviously using my rubs, but trying to have, you know, something a bit out there, a bit different. And um, in doing that, it was, it was a lot of work just doing that, but then I had to go back to normal work. And, you know, when I'm, I've, got an, I've got an alarm set for, um, for Thursday Arvo's and it's called Recipe Drops. I still haven't dropped a recipe on Thursday Arvo because I'm so stuffed with other work. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah, my, my normal everyday work um, just keeps on taking over. So, yeah, it'd be good to have a chance to actually um, just really get into it and um, just put a lot of focus back into that. So, yeah, but that's that's the balance. And I suppose that's what I keep saying. It's a, it's a I suppose it's a hustle every day. Like it's, a, it's a hustle. Of, you know, what, what's the next step? What do I do? What, how do I keep expanding? But still work a normal job. <laughs> it's hard to just jump straight to um, – yeah, you know, living the dream. Like, yeah, the, unfortunately, living the dream is that's why it's called that. It's um, yeah. <laughs> um, so yeah. No, well, one day I'll get there. We'll see. Well, one of the things that you have been doing and uh, and was looking really good was in terms of your marketing and these recipes with your rubs and that that you're referring to. Was you actually partnered up with Barbecue Spit Rotisseries to release a series of videos? Tell us a bit about that experience. Yeah, that was fun. Um, so. I actually live in the street behind Barbecue Spit Rotisseries in Melbourne. Handy. And, <laughs> so, um, yeah, when um, when we were all a bit quiet last year, we um, we ended up um, calling it a business thing and not sure how essential it was, but, um, yeah, we basically um, went round. I just had ingredients. We just sort of – we went round and just started filming and just started – had some fun. Um, yeah, we had different sort of – things to bring to the table. So they wanted me to cook on their units, obviously. And yeah, you know, that, that's, um, that's their brand awareness. And then they'll give me brand awareness, um, you know, with the videos and that and sharing it through their socials. And, um, it, it was, it was fun. It was, uh, but it's strange. Cause like, even now I'm talking into the camera and it, it all feels a bit weird. <laughs> it, it doesn't feel natural. And it was, it was funny doing the videos. Um, because like Michael basically said, all right, so start talking and go. And it's hard to naturally just sort of look right down into a lens and go, okay, this is what we're doing. Whereas that's why I kept looking at you on the screen down here because I sort of, it feels more natural to actually like engage that way. So, um, so yeah, the videos, I suppose it woke me up to like how to talk and how to try to engage in a way. And it was, um, so the first couple of videos started out and they were like, 10 minutes and it's hard to have a 10 minute video that um engages with people because of the way everything is nowadays it's just there's just a sort of a flick through kind of society everyone just sort of wants to just quick you know just give me something quick just yeah just just um put it in and so then we we went from like 10 12 minute videos down to like two minute videos and then it then it started feeling rushed and then so it it's hard to get that kind of balance of what people want and to keep people engaged. Um, like I love long form stuff, but you, you gotta be in the mood for long form stuff. And most of the time people are just, they just want to just have a little flick consume it. And yeah, it's exactly what 
TikTok's going well, I suppose, because it's just little 10 second nothings and yeah, it's just a little sort of, all right, move on, off we go. Um, but yeah, no, I'd love to get back to doing these videos. They were, they were a heap of fun. Um, and yeah, and yeah, we got nominated for um, um, a finalist for video of the year as well as part of the awards. So the ABA awards. So yeah, that was cool. That was fun. Yeah, you did too. I, uh, that's right. Yeah, I, I, I remember seeing your name there on the uh, on the list of nominees. Congratulations on that. Thanks. Yeah, no, there was um, yeah, it was, it was a it was a stiff field of competition though. There's some there was some. Oh, you were up there as well, weren't you? So um, yeah, there's a there's a um, there's a lot of people doing a lot of good things in the Aussie scene with um with videos, and it's it's only going to get better as well. Um, yeah. yeah, there's such good content because all we got was um the USA stuff and. But yeah, to have the kind of videos that are coming out now, they're awesome. So, yeah. Yeah, great stuff. Look, we're going to take another short break and be back again very soon. All right, ladies and gentlemen, as you are aware, winter is nearly here in the Southern Hemisphere. Our Northern Hemisphere uh, friends and family, don't worry, we've got you covered too. But we do have our hoodies and our beanies available. We've got our beautiful Smoking Hot Confessions tumblers, which are going to keep your drinks nice and warm on those cold nights when you're out around the pit. Our T-shirts and our hoodies all feature the Hail Mary logo, which was uh, featured in the NBBQA 2020 conference and awards where it picked up first place for barbecue apparel design. So you can head on over to smokinghotconfessions.com slash shop. Each order helps to support the show, helps us keep the lights on here in the Smoking Hot Confessions studio, and we really appreciate it. So head on over there, check that out, smokinghotconfessions.com slash shop. You're listening to the internationally awarded Smoking Hot Confessions podcast with massive barbecue nerd, Ben Arnott. Okie dokie, it is lesson time now, Stephen. This is the part of the show where our guests are going to give a short lesson to our viewers and our listeners, impart some wisdom, share some knowledge. So I'm just going to sit back with my pen and write a couple of notes and write a couple of questions while you're, uh, while you're teaching us or something. Right. Well, I've probably already given it away. Um, the um, the rub creation. So that was my little my, my little lesson for the listener. It was um, trying to build flavors that are complementary for what you're cooking with. So um, I've sort of I've, I was going to go crazy with um, different flavors, different kind of um, rubs. So I made a um, a mojo rub. So the we have date and beer um, sponsors and. But part of that, we supply them with um, rubs for their cooking. So, um, yeah, Stevie from the from the kitchen, he basically asked, he goes, I, I want a, um, a mojo rub. So mojo for Cubanos, for the, um, so Cubano, the, um, the barbecued pork sliced and um, put into a sandwich with cheese and the ham and the mustard and other things. Um, but there's a rub that the, that the Cubano cooks in to start with. And um, so basically looking up that, that kind of rub, you wanted something like just straight out of the jar to be able to play with. Sorry, I'll get me book out <laughs> so I can um, go back to where I was. So like what I was saying before, the same kind of thing I, I did was um, literally look up ingredients that are in marinades or ingredients that, are, that just kept on coming up in the mojo kind of, vibe in the Cubano um, rub kind of thing. So a lot of them were coming up. Um, so I've got here like sage. Sage was one of those ones that sort of kept coming up and it was just, it was just, it was um, one of those things. So um, what else have I got? The, the, it was still, I suppose the other way to put it is um, it still has to be a rub. It still has to cook good barbecue. It still has to, go on, set a bar and do the right thing. So there's a certain level of salts and peppers and sugars and um, those kind of things you've got to have in there. And then so with the garlic and um, onion, they're in a lot of them, but they're also left out of other ones for a reason. So, um, so sorry. Oh, yeah, bay leaf. That's, that's one of the ones. Um, I know bay leaf's one of those ones that are supposed to go into a, like a, a marinade. You take it out. You don't cook with it. But I end up leaving it in the rub just to have that essence of the bay leaf sort of there. Because um, you can still eat it. Um, and dill, love dill. So um, so one of the ones I'm making is a, is a fish rub. So it's, um, it's something I've been asked a bit to have. 
Um, I reckon there's already a few good sort of rubs out there that, are, that already cover that. But if I can try to put my own spin on that um, to reflect the brand, reflect the, the, the sort of more flavorful kind of rubs rather than the blander kind of rubs. Um, but with the fish, um, you sort of go back to that, that classic kind of thing. It's like, well, what, what works with fish? What works with seafood? And it's, it's usually like a, a butter is a you know kind of thing, but you can get um, powdered butter. Like you can get the flavor now. So, um, so applying that into a rub, but then dill, like dill's always on a, um, on a seafood kind of thing and that kind of stuff. So capers, I'm not sure about it. It's a bit funky, but there's certain things that just keep coming up in, in cooking with fish and like, um, and I've lost it now. Um, there was a, I, had a, I had a full write down. So even the citric acids, so lemon, lemon's one of those things that keeps on coming up. So I suppose in developing rubs, how I do it, my lesson would be look at the comp- complementary flavors and look at what works with that kind of protein, that kind of cooking, um, just to sort of just heighten it. Like the, the, the flavors have been around for so long. So you may as well play on it. Like you may as well play on all that complementary stuff. So, and even um, early on, I was trying to make like apricot chicken because like, you know, sauce like a, um, for barbecue because it was such a just classic recipe that's just always been there. And um, that was, I was trying to put that in some of our competition sauces and yeah, kind of glad I didn't, but it was also <laughs> just one of those things that just, it just ate well at the time as well. So, um, yeah, so uh, not sure if that covers it. <laughs> No, that was good. That 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 was really good. So you you start off with a bit of an idea of the of the end goal, and then you go back to the start. Is that what you're saying? So you go, okay, I want a a fish rub. What goes with fish? Dill. Okay, what else goes with dill? And you just research your way through it, and then start yep. mix like playing with the ratios. Is that about a yeah, fair summary? Much. And yeah, and it's still working with having. So it's, it's almost the, the, the cooking as well. Like the, my beef rub is so far different from the other rubs and they're all different. So I wouldn't want to have the elements that the beef rub has got on a fish because it, I, it just doesn't work. Like, um, mm. I think that if a rub was to go on a fish, it needs to be really light, um, not thick, not sort of, but yeah. Um, it needs to suit that protein that's going on as well. Um, whereas I, wouldn't use a beef rub on like the chicken kind of thing. Um, but I wouldn't use, yeah. So th- there's certain ways that I, I, I use my rubs. Like, um, and I suppose the way I, I like cooking with, um, yeah, sorry. <laughs> That's all right. That's all good. Now you were, you were mentioning um, in, in segment two about uh, developing recipes with sources in mind. So do you, do you eat, do you even include like okay I I, I want to use this sauce at the end of the process so I need to plan my plan my ingredients in my rub to match with that sauce or do you plan the recipe for the rub independent of whatever comes next So the the rubs I've tried making standalone products um I suppose when I was when I was doing the early on stuff um I wouldn't have as much sugar in the in the rub knowing that the sweet was going to come on and finish it off. Um, so I suppose having the, I wanted the, yeah. So I still wanted the rubs to be a standalone kind of thing. So the, the, pro, the product that's out now, um, you can literally use it on one thing, but it, it is also going to be good under a sweet sauce. So yeah, I, I, I get what you're saying. Um, I suppose, yeah, probably my earlier on stuff because not everyone's going to be cooking with, um, with sweet sauces and all that kind of stuff at home and, um, you know, with their, with their barbecue. So I wanted to have something that still just is a standalone product for itself. Um, so I suppose with your question, it was, yeah, it was all the early on stuff. Um, I'd have a lot less sugar in the rub, but I've like, if there were certain elements in that sauce, I knew I wouldn't be needing as much in the rub because it was, it was going to be there and I didn't want to overwhelm, um, with the flavor balances. Yeah, so if you were planning on making a pork rub to go on pork ribs, then you know that what's coming is brown sugar and honey in the middle and then a sauce at the end, so you can scale back yeah, the amount of yeah. sugar in your rub. Yeah, 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 of course, yeah. So I'd, I'd have more paprika, salt, um, pepper, garlic, onion, 
Um, and yeah, the, the, the cardamom and fennel um, tones in there as well. Very nice. And yeah. Now you were t- you were also talking before about um, the possibility of moving into uh, working with a co-packer. So at the moment you're wholly independent. What um, yeah. what what tips do you have for people who are who they've they've got their recipes, they're ready to try and start packaging it and getting it out there, but they're still at they're a couple of steps behind you. So they're still wholly independent, but their product isn't out there yet. What tips have you got for them? I'm not sure. I reckon. On hindsight, I'd, I'd try to go to a co-packer early. Um, I'd, yeah. Um, on hindsight, I suppose, I suppose I, I went um, too far. Um, so now I'm, I'm almost sort of trying to go back a bit to, to then try to work out how to go with a co-packer. Because um, it's, it's the kind of thing where distribution and all the rest of it is getting a bit sort of much. So, But then I also don't want to... Um, so the people who are already using the product, I don't want to change it too much from what they're used to. And I know when you go to like a co-packer or a, a people that um, you know make that that bulk amount of um, stuff, you have to compromise your your recipe. So um so in the beef rub, I've got like um like Aleppo pepper and all these like um there's a couple of different things in there, and it's I shouldn't have put it in there to start with, but it's the kind of thing that if you, if I take it out of there, it's going to be different, and that's the compromise on going with someone like that, um, you need to compromise and try to get the best flavour you can with their ingredients. Um, so I suppose my tip to start with would be, yeah, um, go to a co-packer to start with. Um, if you and yeah, if you if you can get the, their ingredients that they're using, then all the better. Then then you can refine your refine your recipe based off their ingredients. Ah, oh, that's a good tip. I like that one. Very good. Look, that's probably a good point for us to start to, to to wrap this episode of the show up. So I'm going to throw everything over to you now. Give some thanks, give some praise, give some shout-outs to people that have helped you out along the way and tell everybody where they can track you down on the internet. No worries. Um, so you can find the, the Slow Burner Barbecue rubs at um, slowburnerbarbecue.com.au um, through our socials. Um, we've got all the range on there. We've got some specials on the website as well. Um, want to thank um russell and ash um the moist boys at the moment um it's just yeah such a good vibe at the moment um the previous um team members were having jeremy undies and john um I'd like to thank like luke at kelly's meats he looks after us he's incredible um he beads for their um support and products and love and all that um we've got dayton beer that um look after us they um I use their products in their kitchen. It's, it's a good way to get stuff out there. And, you know, they've got incredible craft beers and all that. And, um, yeah, and Barbecue Spirit Rotisseries for um, just helping with the videos and being there the whole time. Like we've, the whole competition, you know, the whole time we've been competing, they've um, they've helped the whole way. So, um, yeah, they've been an incredible support. So, um, yeah, hopefully I haven't missed anyone. And, um, and thank you, Ben. Thank you for having me on. You're welcome, mate. And I'm I'm looking forward to seeing you hopefully uh, use that golden ticket soon and get on over there for the uh, World Championships. Definitely. I'm, I'm hanging to get back there. That was there. Uh, it's um, such a good vibe over there. Yeah. So, yeah. Awesome. All right. Well, look, thank you for your time, mate, and best of luck in your uh, future endeavours. Thanks, Ben. Take it easy. All right, family, there you have it. That was the one and only Westie, Stephen West the uh, multiple trophy winning pitmaster from Moist Barbecue and founder of Slow Burner Barbecue Rubs. I've actually got a bunch of his rubs in the cupboard here. They're a firm favorite here in the house. I can vouch for them on chicken wings. They're one of my favorite ones to put on chicken wings. Very good stuff. Um, All right, so that was some really good information that he shared there. We've uh, heard about all the different partnerships that he's struck up through the competition barbecue scene, working with Dusty Q, working with Barbecue Spit Rotisseries. Um, we've heard about all the different uh, challenges and successes that he's had. And uh, we even got to see that photo of all the trophies from Meatstock Melbourne. So that was an, ex- an outstanding effort. And uh, I heard him get several call-ups at, uh, at Toowoomba as well. So he's done very, very well indeed. And I'm looking forward to seeing some more of those uh, Thursday afternoon content drops that he was teasing us about there before. So that is about all the time that we do have for today. So just remember, BarbieCon is coming. Keep your eyes on the socials. It's an online virtual event, two days, cooking and business. We're going to put it all together and uh, we're going to help you really turn your game around in terms of barbecue and you'll be king of the grill in no time. 
and also our merch is available in the shop, smokinghotconfessions.com slash shop, so you can get in there and help support the show a little bit and help us keep the lights running, which uh, given the age of my house and the age of the suburb I live in is very important. There's a lot of upkeep on this old boat. So uh, anyway, until next time, take care of each other and keep on queuing. Thanks for listening to the Smoking Hot Confessions podcast. Head on over to smokinghotconfessions.com for recipes, tips, and Ben's own confessions. Yeah.